hoping that people can pick up the immediacy of the work, which will be its emotional presence, some of it having big emblematic shapes, and the refined finish of the work, their extremes. So I hope they can pull those kind of contradictory relationship together to form, to understand what I've always been working on, and that is the raw and the refined. It's called also La Cuit and La Cru, which is cooked and raw. And the worst thing with this is that it's totally demanding. You can't make a mistake with the cutting. If you make a mistake with the cutting, because it's all out of one piece, but this will be, in its large scale, will be a triptych. But even still, one piece, a mistake with one of the cuts, that it you can't repair it. It's very unforgiving. This is an maquette process. This is doing it on a small scale to see how it's going to work when it's larger. I mean, they're so much more demanding than this. And they have to be the calculations of cuts per square meterage have to be correct. Thicker cuts do different things thinner than thinner cuts. The length of a cut in relation to its thickness will determine the outcome. So I just have to know how it's going to work. You can build on them, you can sort of develop them. And this is where I explore movement and light and shadow. They're demanding. Yeah, I have to be really focused. Doing the cutting and then doing the designing, there's, there's sort of resistance in me because that is the hard work. It's different from painting and each day watching it grow and being able to change it as you go along. You can't really change these once you've decided on their, on, on their particular image. So they have to be then executed um, sort of perfectly. Once I've done the maquette, I will order the chassis and the frame for the big one. Uh, and that has to be ordered to measure. There's quite a lot of time. It will take a roughly a month to complete a large piece. And the canvas has to be prepared much more than normal canvas because these ribbons or slices will have to withstand temperature change which means there are various glue processes to treat the canvas with so that it doesn't stretch all or shrink. Just making sure all the bands are equidistant from each other and that the evenness of the optics is working. Hello, you made it. Hi, Don. How's it going? Slowly, but I'm getting there. Good. Yeah. She discuss an idea that she's got in her head, and I say, all right, then I'll have a go, and I'll try and make something at home and see if it works. And then I bring the little um, sample back, and we discuss and move on. You know, all right, then, yeah, I can do this, I can't do this. Um, most of the time, I can. my determination in my own self makes me want to do it anyway and have a go at it. We're doing now the, the back pieces, the shadows, right? Setting up the uh, machine to cut the circles out. Um, I'm going to have and to as I mentioned, I think we should arras or chamfer the edges so that the edges disappear and it becomes... Do you think that's a good idea? Or do you think that if they turn 90 degrees, it's better? I think it will um, soften the, what you're trying to achieve with the shadow. 
Well, I'll cut, I'll cut the main circle out. And well, we've got circles here. We can, look, we can sit those under the pieces upstairs. Yeah. glasses of water and so I just picked up some paper and I think Don was in the studio at that time and bent it and then I painted it and pinned it to the wall and it grew from there I could see those in a bigger sequential form and what we have here is 16 it finishes up with 18 but it's actually it's got... 18 and I really really like that aspect of it where there is some sense of body to the form. So it's not just about form, it has body and it has weight as well. Uh, so they become very sculptural and very object-like and that was important in this series. And uh, Don's achieved that through an extraordinary crafting system. This is really about understanding timber. They, these won't even look like timber when they're finished. Everybody asks what they are, you know. They look like they've probably sort of come out of a plastic, plastic mould. Yeah, this is the first one. It, it was made in the same mould as this one, but when I, I took yeah. it out too early and been in the garage, it's gone... Yeah. It's still... it crunk... yeah. It's, that's it, a natural <laughs> curve. Oh, actually, though, we can't really see them fully like this because we need to see... that's right, their shadow bases. We've got gloss on bigger ones, yeah. and this doesn't want to be gloss. This has to be blackboard paint. When I actually sand it to take the sheen off, yeah. I'll, I'll do it with a stroke. I quite like that brush finish, right. so that it disappears. Now we've got three days for that. And you can take this to my studio and work there. Yeah. Right, OK, I'll see what I can do. Should come out exactly how you want them. Well, I think they're beautifully crafted. An cryptologist's memoir is about archaeologists coming to this site in thousands of years' time, hundreds of years' time, let's say. Maybe, you know, it sort of doesn't exist, and they're discovering artworks, they're discovering language, they're discovering things that we're doing on the computer now, but it's also historic that it doesn't have any meaning anymore, but they have to kind of unravel the meaning. They have to sort of search through and lock things, key things in place and find what we were thinking now in 500 years time. So the books are about that. The seed idea came when I was working with layers of paper and I was creating sculptural forms with layers of paper. I started cutting it then, but, but I was cutting the outer form and peeling them over to reveal the, the red of the underside and I was creating images in that way. It seemed to me that books were like vessels and they held secrets inside them that could only be deciphered when you read them. And so they were vessels carry meaning and there are vessels that have meaning and are of meaning. To me, they were also, at that point, they began to suggest could be used as the basis for an artwork. Inside of them I could trap a new layer of meaning, a new language that I was creating, that I wanted want to create. There's little motifs that have to resonate in a very succinct way as being kind of a letter but it's not a letter and it will in some cases relate to the book because the symbol has to just resonate in the way that has a simplicity to it and yet it also is complete. When I do the waxing I can re-sculpt this internal shape and get some depth in there so I can create sort of gutters so that it's got to be a balance between beautiful books that aren't valuable, interesting books and nothing too historically significant. It's the textbook of botany edition for India, Pakistan and Ceylon. Isn't that interesting? 
<gasps> I couldn't possibly cut these up. Oh, they're just beautiful. They're very damaged. No, it's too new, too fresh. No feeling of history, even though it's about history. What about this one? The scallop used in art and architecture. This is pretty interesting. Views of Attica, Greek history. A kind of cheap old paper that yellowed. And it's got cloth bound, the right category. I've really always wanted to be an artist. Since very young. I mean, I started kind of making my own clothes and creating and cutting, just even as a little girl. It's just the most interesting thing to do is to work with materials, to develop a kind of an idea and to be able to manifest it. Manifesting your ideas is the most exciting thing. Seeing them become real and seeing them take shape, take form. And then seeing them in situ, in various sites, whether it be a public space or a gallery.